Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of Allure of the Poor, sponsored by Dracaena Wines. I am your host, Lori, and today I am virtually traveling to West Sonoma Coast, um, and we are with Cleo Palmeyer, and I'm very excited to try these wines, so welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Yes. And I, you know, I have to start off with, uh, I'll let everybody know, we kind of met e- through email by accident, whatever. And, you know, it's like a happy accident. I was like, oh, look at here. And, um, you know, I was like, I don't know, what can we talk about? There's so much between your family and what you have done and everything. So it was, uh, it wasn't an easy task to, fin- you know, finite those questions down a bit. Um, but uh, we're going to focus on your project of uh, Wayfarer. And um, I am thrilled to have two bottles. So we are going to do a vertical. I have a 2019 way, I always do it backwards, Wayfarer. And then we have the 2020 Wayfarer. And these are both Fort Ross Seaview, uh, Sonoma County AVA, right? All right, perfect, perfect. So before we get into it, I just want to, you know, share people with my first question is always the origin story. So you have you have an interesting origin story, how you got into wine. So can you share that with us? Of course. Yeah, my um, it starts with my dad um, and his love of wine. Um, he grew up in Northern California in Oakland. And, um, and so wine country was never too far away. He started out pursuing a law career, but he always said, I found myself reading more wine journals than law journals. Well, Mm -hmm. go figure. And so uh, these days it would be listening to more wine podcasts. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And so, um, and so he just fell in love with wine and, uh, and started pursuing it. My grandfather uh, introduced him to wines by taking him to France and they visited Champagne and Bordeaux. And then that's where he really started to get the wine bug. Um, fast forward a little bit and he left his law career and uh, started Palmire Winery in Napa uh, in the 86 was the first vintage. Um, uh, our first winemaker for Palmire was Randy Dunn followed by Helen Turley in the 90s. Um, and so in that period, my dad, in the nineties, my dad started to get more and more into Pinot Noir. His first love was Bordeaux and his dream was to make his own Mouton, which he did with the Paul Meyer, uh, proprietary red. Um, but he always says every enophile eventually gravitates to the wines of Burgundy. And so, um, Helen, of course, um, made her name making Colt Cabernets, but is probably better known today for her own. Uh, Marcusan label, which is Pinot Noir and Chardonnay uh, from a vineyard not too far from Wayfair now. And so um, so she introduced my dad to a property for sale not far from Marcusan, like I said, in what's now the new West Sonoma Coast AVA. Um, it's also um, the more smaller AVA that we're also in is called Fort Ross Seaview. Um, and then West Sonoma Coast is kind of around us now. <laughs> um, and so um, and so she introduced him to this property and brought my dad out there and he just fell in love. So this region is truly coastal when you hear Sonoma Coast. Um, it really, I mean, it can go very far inland as far as Carneros, which, um, you know, borders Napa. And, um, and so in a lot of the areas of the Sonoma Coast are not cool wine growing regions. They're actually quite warm wine growing regions. And so um, and so where we are in Fort Ross Seaview and the greater West Sonoma coast is truly cool wine growing region. And up in the Northern um, coastal mountain range where Fort Ross Seaview is, we are close to the ocean. So Wayfair is um, four miles from the Pacific. Some of the vineyards in this region are much closer, um, two miles or less. And um, so the proximity to the coast is really important, but then also elevation plays a huge role here. Anybody that's ever driven along, you know, the famous Highway 1 on the California coast knows that, you know, as soon as you start to head inland, you're climbing up, um, you're climbing up the the mountains and, you know, and and this road, you know, hugs these mountains along its way up the coast. So, um, and so the vineyards are planted along the ridgelines. 
um, above the fog line. Um, if below the fog line is where redwood forests thrive, and um, above the fog line is a relatively new region for for growing wine. And so my dad um, <clears throat> planted the vineyard, bought the land, and planted the vineyard. He got David Abreu to um, plant the vineyard. It's still to this day the only Sonoma vineyard that David Abreu has developed, and oh. um, and and started um, harvesting fruit in 2005, which we were blending into our Palmyre Pinot Noir and Chardonnay at the time. And uh, I started working with my dad in 2008. And as I got to know the vineyard more, more than just, you know, a place that he would take me <laughs> and go out there for weekends. And I, as I got to know the wines, um, I started advocating with my family and the company to create an estate label because we were blending the fruit with other Russian River vineyards. But if you think about the great wines of the world, they're not from a blend of various vineyards, they're from one truly special site and Wayfair had definitely become that. And so when the vineyard was 10 years old in 2012, uh, we harvested our first vintage that would be Wayfair. Um, and, so, and so now um, today, um, our, my family sold Paul Meyer um, at the end of 2019, but held, we held on to Wayfair. And I'm actually the only family member that's still involved in the, in the business. So um, carrying so, on the legacy. Yeah. So great carrying that on. Um, I sold the business for my family. And, and then with Wayfair, I have the pleasure of being able to focus on this really small um, project with a really tight team. Um, majority of uh, whom have been with me for almost 10 years now since we were with Palm, since we were part of Paul Meyer and um, get to focus on what um, I'm really passionate about something that I got to start um, as opposed to just carrying on what I was doing with Paul Meyer, which my dad started. And so you actually, I'm curious because you studied art history, which is so cool. I mean, I love art and the history behind it is, is, you know, the history of how these artists made the painting and how they came around is so intriguing to me. But when you were studying that, what you obviously were like, yeah, I'm not doing wine. So I'm going in this different route. So what was your career process, you know, goal when you were studying art history? Well, I have to say that I didn't think very much about <laughs> where it would lead me. <laughs> I was more, my focused on was my mother, my dad thought, Cleo, you should, you know, go to the business school or, you know, get an undergraduate business degree or something like that. And my mother thought, was told me, just study what you're passionate about. <laughs> so I clearly took my mother's advice. <laughs> um, but ultimately when I graduated, what I really wanted was a career in business. Um, and, um, and I was able to, after, you know, doing a few other things, I was able to find that through working with my, with my dad. So that's, um, so that's kind of, how I got from my education into business. But, you know, if you, I mean, I think there's lots of business professionals um, in the world today that learned everything they know about what they do in their job through their oh, job. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I And I think that in previous, you know, like decades ago, like, you know, my parents and their parents, you know, well, maybe not their parents because they didn't go to college, but you know, like, you know, those, those previous generations, they went to college to do specifically what they went to college for. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's true anymore. I think people go to college to experience more so the college, you know, experience and learn this, learn that. And I think today more people are finding their, yeah, this is what I went to college for, but that's not really what I'm passionate about. And I'm going to find a way to adapt that to to what I'm really passionate about. So I don't think you're alone in that at all. I think many people have gone to college for one thing and, you know, found a different route to it, to what they're doing. And, you know, you have to be passionate about it. Otherwise, it's kind of dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so you actually, you came in kind of with, you know, like a wrecking ball thing. You were named one of the 40 under 40s. So when you first got into the industry, you must have made quite the hit for your own name. And it, 
sometimes I think it might be difficult when you have uh, the generation above you who has made such a name for themselves to make a name for yourself, but you've done that. So congratulations. Um, how did that feel? <clears throat> well, I, um, is one of the things that really drove me to get involved with, um, with the, with the winery was because my dad was expressing, he wanted to step back more than he had, even more than he had already. And he wanted to step back and retire. And I thought, well, if you don't have the family at the helm and really driving the vision of a business like this, it loses its soul. It loses its reason for being what made it great in the first place. And so when I s stepped into that role in the winery, there, there had been a you know significant period of time where there was nobody there. My dad was out front you know, through the 80s, 90s, but by the 2000s, he had taken a step back. You can only <laughs> go at that pace for so long. Um, and so, um, and so we were really building the brand back up a lot at that point and putting a lot of um, intentional effort into that. And so, and so that was, that was my role in stepping out into that and, and being sort of the new front person, I guess, for, um, for the brand and, and then on, on internally, then also taking it to the next level, um, as an organization and as, um, and as far as our winemaking and viticulture, as far as the quality of the products that we were making. So let, let's go back to the vineyard itself, the Wayfarer Vineyard. It, uh, Helen Turley found it kind of for, for you guys, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was kind of an off, it was an off the grid vineyard, which I don't know if any vineyard was on the grid back then, but what was, what was a, meant by off the grid vineyard? Well, it was owned by a couple of hippies that have moved out to this super rural area as part of the back to the land movement. And, you know, so this area has like cattle ranches and then, you know, just huge parcels owned by, you know, somebody who's it's been in the family for generations and so there's not much happening out out in this area um, aside from cattle ranching and in the past a lot more logging of course um but um so it, these um this couple the davises they actually there was no vineyard but they had mm -hmm. an organic farm and would sell their produce to local restaurants um like one of them was chez panisse which is <laughs> known as being like the pioneering farm to table restaurant um, in the U.S. and um, and they also ran a school for children that you know whose parents needed didn't know what to do with them and um, and raised animals and things like that. So um, so very much off the grid. You know, composting toilets. There, there's electric. They, they were technically on the grid. There's electricity. <laughs> um, and so um, and so when my dad. So, so my dad just fell in love with it. You know, he saw like the produce that they were growing out there and thought, well, they can ripen these beautiful fruits and vegetables this close to the coast in this climate Then I know we can make great Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So, um, so, uh, so that, yeah, so then he, he bought the land and then, um, and then developed the vineyard. So it's, it's just 30 acres, um, planted to Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And just this year we harvested our first half acre of Syrah. So we're starting oh. we're trying out a little bit of Syrah out there because there's some, um, you know, there's some cool climate Syrah uh, producers in this region and other places that are making really um, great wines. And so we wanted to see what we could do um, at Wayfair. So uh, TBD, but the, the first, um, the first Syrah is in barrel. <laughs> now. Okay. So, um, yeah. And so, um, and so, yes, yeah, so we planted the Pinot Noir and, um, and Chardonnay out there, just 30 acres. And so all the wines that we make are just from our one vineyard um, on, on the coast. And how did you, so, so again, you know, Helen Turley's vineyard is nearby. She saw that it went on the market. She let your father know um, when your, and your father came and fell in love with it. What, like, what is that? to walk up to a vineyard that's how, how big is the site? Cause you're planted to 30 acres, but it's larger than that. Yeah, but it's actually not that big of a parcel. It's just, um, 70 acre parcel. Okay. Um, and so, um, 
And so, the, and that's unusual for this area. Generally, the parcels are hundreds of acres okay. um, large. Um, yeah. So, so when he, um, yeah. So when he when he found it, it was really like the 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 cool air, the and then the the elevation really brings um, what my dad calls luminosity, like the that quality of sunlight. Um, that's really important. Well, it's really important in tannin development. Um, because even with Pinot Noir, which isn't, you don't think Pinot Noir and tannins necessarily, but obviously it's a really important aspect of, of any wine, any red wine. And so, um, yeah, that elevation um, and the, the quality of the light enhances the, the skin tannins in, in, the, in the wine. So. And you're, you're in love with Burgundy. So when you see this land and you see the soils, um, I've got to find this because I, I loved this. So on your website, it says Burgundians may boast their vaunted uh, Kimmeridgian limestones, Germans of their slate, the Chateauvians of their rounded stones, Sonomans uh, slap the Gold Ridge trump card down and reach for the chips. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. But yeah. I don't know so what I don't know what Gold Ridge um, is. So could you explain okay. that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So well, so this soil is um, really famous in Russian River, and it's pretty ubiquitous throughout Russian River, which is has long been a very um, highly acclaimed and uh, respected Pinot Noir growing region. And so it's a sandy um, loam, so it's a mix of sand and clay, um, and it's you know from the you know, it's pushed up from ancient, you know, sea floor. And so it's very well draining, uh, which is, which is particularly important where we are at Wayfair, because this is this climate in this region, you know, we've been talking about drought, 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 but our typical rainfall is over 60 inches. I and, saw that. Oh my and, goodness. Uh, so it's, it's a, a coastal rainforest is the climate. And um, so it's really important. I mean, in, in a drought year, we'll get more like 20 inches, but we're lucky that we don't have water issues because our pond will fill up with just 20 inches of rain. Wow. Yeah, so that's good. But, um, but yeah, so, so it's very well draining, but there is enough clay content that it, it retains moisture. And then there's a sandstone substrate. So um, yes, yeah, so we've been very lucky. We haven't had to pull any vines since the, um, since the, uh, the vineyard was planted. And so everything is still uh, it's on, you know, over 20 year rootstock um at this point and um yeah so so in it's the gold ridge soil is also interesting because in fort ross seaview there's a great diversity of soils um but gold ridge isn't one that's very common and so it's actually really unique to have this gold ridge soil on our site um, and it's also very uniform which um you know, there's so many different aspects in viticulture. It's nice to have a more uniform soil, but you know, there's a lot of interesting vineyards where winemaker in this region where winemakers have done a lot of work to try to understand, you know, they may have six or seven different soil types just in their one, you know, 30 acre vineyard. But we do have a very, we have really great uniformity um, uh, on the site as far as soil. Um, but we also have both east and west facing aspects um, and um, lots of diversity within the site just not with the soil. <laughs> so the east west would cut would be important with all of that rainfall so mm -hmm. that it can right cuz you Yeah, so we have a lot of rainfall. So Yeah, so we have um you know the the west facing aspect is more gently sloping and then the both the east facing aspects are um pretty um steep. Um so that's that also is very important to with that amount of rainfall. And so in these vineyards um you it's planted on on the king ridge right mm -hmm. so and you're talking about this rainfall so are are you on like and I, I always forget which is which windward or whatever but like one side of the mountain gets the rain and then the mountain stops the rain and the other side doesn't mm -hmm. so you're on the side that the rain comes in because once it hits the top right the rest of so, the, the yeah in this region, it's a little bit more, um, so in like a Napa Valley, you know, uh, it's really easy to see, or it's, it's um, easy to see, but it's, uh, if you're just looking up the valley, you can see that the Western mountain range is very green. <laughs> and then the Eastern mountain range is very dry and just small, you know, shrubby trees. And so you can see that, that clearly the, the Western uh, mountain range gets a lot more um, 
rain. And then those that moisture doesn't quite make it all the way over to the western side. But in Fort Ross Sea View, the there's um, two ridge lines that run along the coast. So um, the vineyards in this region, um, so you vineyards are either planted on the first ridge line or the second ridge line. And so we're on the second ridge line. So we're a little bit more protected from um, the, we, I think both ridge lines get similar amounts of moisture. It's um, it's more protected from the more extreme, more breeze and, and cold. Um, so we're a little bit warmer and, and a little bit less, you know, breeze coming through. So a little bit more favorable when you're looking at set and, and bloom and things like that. Um, but um, but yeah, but being on the second ridge line means we're a little bit more protected from um, the elements. But I think I'd say we get similar rainfall. Okay. And so what about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay just makes your heart a flutter? Like why, why these two? Yeah. Um, well, so, I mean, I have to say that similar to my dad, my tastes in wines uh, have evolved and are still evolving, of course. Um, but I, I just love Chardonnay and Pinot Noir for so many reasons. I'll start with, um, I mean, well, both of them are so versatile as far as, as far as enjoying just on their own or, um, or with meals. I mean, and in particular, I have to say that I'm a huge Chardonnay fan. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a very expensive habit though, I have to say, <laughs> because any people that I meet that say they don't really love Chardonnay, you know, it's easy to find not great Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's you have to you have to seek out and pay a little bit more for um the really great chardonnays of the world but when you are when you do have a really world class chardonnay in your glass i find that there's few things better in life <laughs> <laughs> uh it is an expensive habit though but um i mean chardonnay is uh is just it can be consumed with so many different um so many different meals from you know of course you know what you would think of like fish dishes or crab or lobster to a roast chicken um, or a beautiful pork dish. Um, it just has so much body and volume, but also with that beautiful acidity um, in the wines. And that's, and that's also what I look for in Pinot Noir. I look for that volume in the mouth and that length, but then also the energy in the wines. And with wines, I, I, I mean, that's, that's what I really look for in a quality wine not obviously they have to have beautiful aromatics but the specific aromatics that you're smelling and tasting aren't to me as important as the textural and the the components and, and the feel of the wine and and to me the acidity and the the tannin well those those things that go into the structure of a wine are a feel um and uh and anyway so so i love i love pinot noir and chardonnay for that reason because they they have so much versatility but they um they have so much to offer, but always with energy, at least if they're, if they're good, they have to have that energy to make you take the next sip. You know, like I've had Cabernets that are rated a hundred points and I don't want to take more than one sip because it's, it's like drink. It's like, you know, sharing a super rich chocolate mousse at dinner. It's like, you can only have so much of that. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Well, this um, I'm sitting here and I'm swirling and the aromatics are so pronounced that they're like, I, I mean, the people who are listening to the podcast aren't going to be able to do this, but it's a good, ha you know, hand away from my, from my mm -hmm. face and I'm swirling. And as I'm swirling, mm -hmm. the aromatics are, are in, you know, coming up yeah. and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to have to taste this. I was going to wait, but no, I'm going to have to taste this. Well, that, and that's another thing about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay too, is that they, I mean, they tend to be, or especially Pinot Noir, they just such incredible range of aromatics in, in those wines. And like, I love it when I just stick my nose in the glass and my mouth is already watering. Mm -hmm. That's how I know it's going to be a great <laughs> wine. Um, yeah. So this is the 2019. Um, how, how do you process your Chardonnay? And then, but we're going to get more after we talk about processing, I want to dive into clones because I am so geeky about clones, Yeah. but yeah. just general processing for the 2019, um, you, you harvest looking for what specs, um, you know, and on your, I'm just, 
-hmm. I think all great winemakers are walking the vineyards. They're not, you know, chemistry is fantastic, but it's, I think the final decision is the mouth. So what are you looking for when it comes time to harvest? And then how are you processing it from taking it from the vineyard into the winery? So, um, so our, our winemaker is Todd Cohn, um, and he's been with Paul Meyer since, well, started with Paul Meyer, <laughs> with Wayfair, <laughs> though, um, since the first vintage was in barrel, um, and then became head winemaker um, in 2018, <laughs> so, um, or at the end of uh, 2017. Um, and so, um, so with, it's with, the, you just mentioned clones. And so that makes a big difference because as far as the chemistry of the fruit at harvest, we look for different things in different clones. Like we have one Chardonnay clone that if that where we were waiting a little bit longer, you'll have some higher bricks, but cause that's the, that's the clone that really brings that fleshiness to the wine and the density. Um, and then we have another clone that we harvest at a different chemistry because that clone just tastes better um, at, at, with lower with lower bricks. Um, with it, in in that that that's the clone that brings more of that acidity um, and minerality to to the wine. So um, we harvest at night, um, starting at 10 p.m. and we'll go through to the morning. So the fruit will then arrive. So we're very very remote. That's one thing I haven't mentioned yet. Um, is Wayfair. Um, from Santa Rosa, where our winery is, it's 90 minutes. <laughs> and so oh, a 90 minute drive to get you to You got to travel when it's, when it's cold. Exactly. And so the fruit will arrive at the winery um, first thing in the morning um, and be processed. So we'll sort the clusters um, and then um, they'll go directly into um, a bladder press or a champagne press. And then um, our winemaker is there always on site to do to make the press cuts, which are very important. So he'll taste the juice as it's coming out, um, and then he'll make a couple different cuts and separate those lots. Um, and that's really important because if you're pressing too much, you can get component. You'll get more juice, but you'll get um, flavors that aren't that we don't want. Because right, um, you're doing, you know, for the whites, you're doing a whole cluster. Exactly. So. Exactly. And so, and so then we'll put that juice into stainless steel tanks and let it settle overnight. Um, because obviously all the skins and the clusters have all sorts of sediment and stuff on them. Um, and then we'll rack that juice to, um, oak, all French oak barrels, about 50% neutral, 50% new okay. in the 2019, there's a little bit more new oak, maybe more like 60%. Um, and then, and then the the bottom of that stainless steel tank, once all of the juice has been put to barrel, are the lees, and it's these kind of yellowy, orangey um, sediment that 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 comes off the grape. So we'll take the good lees and then put a little bit in each barrel. Oh, okay, nice. And that really nice. helps. Um, I mean, it just it adds to the the wine um, and the body of the wine, and um, and so. Um, so then the wine will go through alcoholic fermentation and 100% malolactic fermentation. We'll stir the lees um, through alcoholic fermentation and then um, cut down significantly on the stirring um, through malolactic fermentation. And then, um, and then the wine stays in barrel. Um, we'll do the blends in um, um, March usually. And then, um, and then, so all the wine will then get blended together in a tank and then put back into barrel until December. Um, and then we'll bottle in December. So it's 15 months um, in barrel, but the malolactic fermentation takes quite some time. And so, um, so we like to have that a little bit more of the age. Um, and you're doing all native. So it's, you know, for, for wineries that are using commercial everything, it's, it's kind of a lot faster. Um, yes. you know, yeah. so, yeah, it, it'll, it, will take, it will take a long, a long time. Right. Uh, but that's, but that's what we want. Um, cause you know, anybody that's ever had like a really buttery, you know, Chardonnay, I mean, that can be achieved by trying to get it through malolactic really quickly, uh, really warm fermentations. And so we just let it go, um, naturally, um, just on its own pace, you know, some years will be different just based on 
the yeast that comes in with the fruit, you know, that year, um, or the, you know, the chemistry of the fruit in any given year. So every year it'll be a little bit different. Sometimes you'll just have fermentations will finish up sooner, but, um, but we, we let it just do what it wants to do naturally. <laughs> the, and the 2019 has a bit more minerality to it than, than the 2020 and the 2020 has a bit more body to it than, mm -hmm. than the 19. Yeah. And I like that we, we do take a little bit of the wine and put it in stainless steel, um, in August. And then, um, and so we'll blend that back in, um, before, uh, bottling. And we did that in 20, we started doing that in 2020. And I think it gives also just a little touch of a nice reductive note. Um, you know, not, not too much, but just right. a nice little, that's um, a nice balancing act that the, you know, that reductiveness is, is beautiful in small, you know, it's, it's like that friend that is so loud that, yeah, you love being with them, but in small doses. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. Sometimes re a reduction can just take over. Right. Wine right. And, and you, there's not, you can't get anything out of it except for those reductive notes. So. Right. I would say both of these, you can tell um, because of the body that's in there, um, you can tell that it it's in oak, but it is, it's not the, that overpowering butter and oakiness that we can see um, in some places, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, um, but again, the, the, in, in terms of color wise, they're almost exactly the same. They both have a, a, they're a pale like goldish with almost like a greenish hue to it like a you know like um but the the aromatics are are very different they have they you know the the 19 like i said it is kind of like lemon curd you know and and minerality where <laughs> the 2020 it, it, and this is a strange thing to say, but oh, by the aromatics, you can tell it's a fuller wine. Like it's, it's a bigger, it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's a bigger mm -hmm. um, aromatics and it's more, there. there's like, um, almost like the, um, like, uh, the, like an apple, it's not an apple pie, but you know, that like that, the essence of, of the spice that's in that apple pie, you know? Mm -hmm. It's, it's the, the flavors have gone are too different and that's probably has more to do with the, the vintages, the heat or the temperature or the climate of the vintage, but the aromatics have gone from like the, a greener to a riper in the, in mm -hmm. the 2020. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and the other thing about the Chardonnays too, is that they, they're going to age really beautifully. Um, the acid is the backbone to this one to both yeah. of them are yeah and that's really and i mean and that's all site site driven um and and the farming the farming is really important you can't just have a great terroir you have to also have meticulous farming and do it doesn't matter you know yeah we did leafing we did the canopy management you have to do it at the right times in um in development anybody that's ever tried to you know grow like have like a backyard garden like I'm one of them every year my husband and I are like oh, what did we do wrong with the <laughs> this year like we should have pruned them or done this or that because I mean just left a, a you know tomato is a vine just like um um you know um a, like a, a grapevine grape. as, a, as a vine and they just they just want to go crazy they just want to keep um being vines and so you have to um, get them to focus on the fruit. <laughs> Absolutely. And it is, um, it is an incredibly tricky and scientific thing that, um, that Todd, our winemaker is really good at. <laughs> so Todd does the vineyard management also, you do not have a separate vineyard manager. No. Okay. So he's, he's, he's in both feet from, from the dirt to the bottle. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. And that's how he has always been well he one of his earliest uh winery positions was at opus one and he always says well, what a horrible resume <laughs> i know Michael Slots, he always said like that like he, his employees are have to work in both places there isn't just vineyard and just or winery separately you have to have 
both. And so, and I, I agree with that 100%. I, I get that some winemakers prefer to be in the winery and there's some winemakers that who really prefer to be in the vineyard, but it's the great winemakers that, that do both. Because I don't think, I don't think you can truly understand the grapes unless you're seeing them in the vineyard and how they act. They, and I, We'll get into Pinot because that's even more, but but I think Chardonnay is one of those grape varieties that is, no, I'm going to do what I want to do, right? And and I, I think Chardonnay needs to be reined in a bit. Like it wants to go crazy in the vineyard mm-hmm. and it, it's a, somebody who's in the vineyard needs to know how to tame it down without shutting it down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and any great winemaker likes to have, I mean, you likes to have control over what they're doing. And, um, and Helen Turley told my dad from the very beginning, if you want to make world-class wine, you have to control your food sources. You have to be the one in control. So, you know, there's a couple of ways to do that. You could develop really great relationships with the growers you work with. And there are a lot of examples of that, but that's hard. Like not, there are not too many growers out there that, care as much about your wine quality as they do about their bottom line, right. you know, and can you blame them? Um, and so to have a state fruit makes such a big difference in wine. And, and then, and then on top of that, to have the winemaker not battling with the vineyard manager, because when you're running a winery, a lot of times you'll find your winemaker and your winemaking team and then your vineyard team at odds. And, um, you know, so to have that alignment or to just have one person <laughs> calling all the shots, That's, it's, um, you know, it's a recipe for, you know, great things, great, news, great right? results. Right. And now if we bring it back to the clones, okay. So, um, you have, I'm, I'm whipping out a number cause I was scanning through somewhere, somewhere in the vicinity of like seven, Chardonnay clones, but like maybe 15 Pinot clones. So a little bit less than that. We okay. have four Chardonnay clones okay. and um, 11 Pinot. Oh, I was close with the Pinot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah, so, so the Pinot Noirs, and I'm sorry that you ended up getting two Chardonnays instead of a Chardonnay and a Pinot Noir, <laughs> so you don't have anything to taste. But um, so with the Pinot Noirs, we make our estate Pinot Noir, which is a blend of all 11 clone clonal selections that we okay. have planted. And, um, and so some wineries or a, a lot of wineries and, you know, and in Burgundy, you'll have, it'll just be, um, you know, field blends or massal selection. And what that means is basically, you know, whatever's planted in the vineyard, you just go through and take your budwood and then just use that, whatever it may be, and then continue on or, you know, when you're doing a replant or when you're expanding your vineyard or when you're um, planting a whole new vineyard. Um, but what we did is we did it um, in, in a lot and other wineries do what we do too. And so what they'll do and what we did is we divide the vineyard into specific blocks, one acre blocks in our case, and we plant each block to um, a different clonal selection that we, we know what we've got and um, you know, and so we, we got them from different sources though. Some we got from other vineyards some we got from nurseries, some, um, we have one clonal selection. That's actually a suitcase clone, um, that we got. I was going to say that, or, or a shoebox clone, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so, um, and so Pinot Noir is really fascinating because more than any other wine grape variety, it has um, the ability to mutate based on where it is. And so what you end up with with Pinot Noir is you have dozens and dozens of clonal selections um, to choose from. You know, there are some that are, um, you know, that are better known in different regions. Um, And and anyways, in in each of these, um, you know, to make it extra confusing though, you will have like Pomard is a common one. So obviously you have Pomard um, orig- originating in Burgundy, yeah. but Pomard planted in one California vineyard versus a Pomard planted in an Oregon vineyard, you taste those wines and they taste completely different. So on top of having, you know, the the clones 
well, it's part that goes hand in hand with the Pinot Noir's ability to mutate is that it also takes on the character of where it's planted. Big time, um, right? And so um, anyway, so Pinot Noir is kind of your wine geeks, wine varietal for so many reasons. And that's just one of them. But um, so what we, so with, so with the estate blend, we have this, um, you know, co great complexity of clonal selections that we, that we put together for that wine. Um, and then we make five other Pinot Noirs all from just the one vineyard. And what they are, are block selections of okay. a particular, of an individual clone or a blend of two clones. And so when you have the opportunity, which isn't, I mean, it's not very often that I have the opportunity where I'm opening up every one of our wines from a you know particular vintage, but there is a, a significant diversity in, um, in each Pinot Noir just based on the block selection that it came from, even though it is all come from the one same 30 acre vineyard. And so that's really fun. And so these, these clones, I'm, I'm going to assume, so tell me if I'm wrong, but the only way you can do this is you're harvesting each clone individually, you're keeping it separate, you're processing it all separately. And then for your estate, when it comes time for bottling, you're sampling each of these different barrels that you're, that you've maintained. And then you're choosing, I want this percent from this barrel, this percent from this barrel, and this is going to be my estate. Exactly. And we'll, what we'll do is we'll actually do put together the blend in uh, March following harvest okay. and then let the wine and then, then put it back into barrel, but we'll blend Marry. it all together and then put it back in the barrel. It's kind of like how, you know, a soup always tastes better on the second night. Right, <laughs> let, right. uh, let the wines get to know each other. Um, and um, so we'll make the blending decisions in March and then put everything back up. Uh, you know, blend things, put them back in barrel and then bottle them um, later on. And that, I think that's a scary concept too, because as you're blending, you're doing everything with, uh, I call it unmarried, right? So you're doing it with this barrel and this barrel and this barrel, and you're trusting your palate to say, okay, these work well together, but now, once once wine gets blended, you can't unblend it, right? Mm -hmm. So now you're going to, I've made my decision of what this blend is, and I'm going to put it together. And now you're hoping that that marriage of those barrels actually is a good marriage. And yeah, right? and that it's going to continue like to be good. I mean, and that's, and that's where um, like my, my, you know, knowledge as a winery owner has to or where, where my expertise stops and then I have to trust my winemaker and right. so a lot of times in the blending sessions we'll have opinions about the wines but we'll we'll they'll you know there'll be four or five four of us tasting the wines together um and we'll all have opinions about the wines I mean they're all good we rarely outright reject anything but um but ultimately we the the conclusion is okay, he, he, you know, he takes all of our feedback and comments about each wine. And then, um, and then ultimately he makes the he makes final it. call, but oh, so many times we're split 50, 50 and Todd, like where I, if I was Todd, I'd be like, ah, oh. <laughs> he loves it. He thinks it's great because he's, I think he's, I think it's a sense of validation because here he has been in his office tasting, you know, blend after blend after blend, you know, tweaking, 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 and he's going back and forth in his mind, you know, and, and then I think he sees some validation because then with all of us in the room tasting, we'll be going back and forth and we'll all like different things. And so, so he's, great. he's proud. He's creating options that are both, that are both Decision, phenomenal. Yeah. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And so the, go, with these clones, that you have. Um, well, first of all, let me ask, do you use all of your own fruit or do you actually sell some of your fruit? We, we use all of our, all of our own fruit. Um, and, um, yeah, and, and we, and we don't purchase any fruit. Right. Okay. So you're not selling fruit at all. It's all, it's all for Wayfair. Yeah. Okay. And then as you're going through these clones, do you, do you have a, a favorite child? You know, it changes uh, vintage to vintage. Um, 
one wine that we always love is um, the Traveler, which is our suitcase clone. Um, it's just, and it's always really shy. Um, it's not always the highest scored wine because this wine is definitely the most ageable and the, the slowest to open up both to, to the slowest to evolve in the bottle, but also the slowest to open up in the glass. Um, but it is, um, it's, it's just has an incredible range of just exotic aromatics and the tannin quality and the length is, and the, and the acidity are, are just very, just stand out. And so always, always love that wine. And how many, how many Pinots are on your skew? How many skews do you have for Pinot? So we make six Pinot Noirs. Um, so we make our state wine and then um, the other five are block selection. So the traveler is one of them. And then, and then we also have a second label called WF2, um, which is all estate. Um, it's $45 a bottle. So it's half the price of our estate Pinot Noir. Um, and um, we make no money on it, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but we bottle it for our customers because um, it's delicious in it you know, it's great for the price. And, um, and it's just sort of a, it's, it's a great wine to have. That's not something special every night. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Uh, and so we take, we, we we're in the barrel room and we've got our clones separated. So your traveler is, are you always looking for the same similar, you know, similar components of those clones that are going in or can one year, like if you've got all of these clones, I'm trying to to figure out how you bottle what mm -hmm. what makes the difference between each of your six clones, six of six bottles. Yeah, well, so when we bring in the fruit, it's all harvested block by block and kept separate. Um, and then and I'm sorry, each block is going to be its own separate clone. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So each block is kept separate when it's harvested, um, and then every tank has its has a every block goes into its own tank um and then and then when the tanks are barreled down those barrels are tracked you know and and, and the wine and the lots are kept separate and so but we'll have we have some um you know we have 30 blocks and 11 clones so we have blocks um so we'll have the same clone in different blocks and so okay. the the makeup you know of, of one of our block selection cuvées one year it could be more from one block and less from another block it just depends on on the year um but it's always the same clones okay and then do you and i did i ask this do you do a single clone um yeah so two okay. of our bottlings are single clones so the traveler and then uh pages ridge is a dijon 667 um okay. clone so this is our most like california style um, richest, if you will. Um, we ferment it in a wood tank. Um, so the clone just does so well, um, uh, with that, with a little bit more oxygen, um, in that tank, the wood tank influence early on. Um, and then, and then two other of our, um, cuvées are a blend of two different clones. So golden mean is a blend of pomard and swan. And so the name golden mean comes from uh, this beautiful, or it means this beautiful middle between two opposites because pomard and swan are truly opposites. Pomard is very earthy and structured and dense and, you know, and spicy. And the swan is very light and ethereal and floral and aromatic. And so we blend those two for the golden mean cuvee. And then the last cuvee is mother rock. And this is interesting because these, um, it's kind of happened by accident because these blocks always ripen at the same time. They're always ready to be picked at the same time. And so the first vintage, that, that was one of the blocks that we just ended up co-fermenting, which means we put the two clones together and fermented them together in tank. And um, there, these two blocks um, are planted in the shallowest soil of the vineyard. And so the vine roots have gone down into the sandstone substrate or the mother rock of the vineyard. Um, and this wine just has a ton of intensity and minerality um, as a result. And so it's really unique for that reason. That's awesome. And then in terms of what you recommend people to hold on to the Pinot, what do you, what is your tasting window recommendations? You know, I love drinking wines young and like I love seeing what they are. 
Um, you know, you can always decant wines. And um, so I always advocate for, you know, trying them young, but then, you know, for great bottles of wine, you always want to buy a few, drink a couple younger and then drink them as they age. But, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, five to eight years is another beautiful period to drink the wines. Um, and, you know, and, and we're constantly looking at our winemaking and tasting older vintages and just trying to improve year after year. And so, um, and so to, and, and part of that is also to improve the ageability and see, you know, how, how these wines evolve over time. And so we're constantly learning and, um, and trying to improve, but there are some of our cuvées that have aged really beautifully, um, for, for 10 years. And for the Chardonnays, I think both of the, you know, the Chardonnay in general, uh, I think that, well, unless you're in Burgundy, people kind of think, you know, you got to drink Chardonnay relatively quickly. Yeah. And the structure to these Chardonnays um, definitely, can, they, these can sit also. These are definitely ageable Chardonnays. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think, um, you depending on the vintage, um, some of our Chardonnays are beautiful 10 years down the road, um, but certainly like five years is a wonderful sweet spot for the sharp yeah. as well absolutely and now where where can uh people find wayfair how do they find you so we um are on our website you can order our wines um the block selections are allocated to to, to join our mailing list um but um but the state wines the chardonnay and the pinot noir and our wf2 wines our second label those are all available um, just at wayfarervineyard.com. Um, and then we also have distribution around the country. It's harder to find wines in your local retail stores, but, um, but um, you know, since COVID, more and more restaurants <laughs> are, are coming back and ordering. And so that's been a, a great thing to see as well. And what about is your average case production? Yeah, so we um, make about 4,000 cases of wine a year okay. in total. Um, the estate Pinot Noir and the estate Chardonnay are each around a thousand cases of each. Um, and the other wines are, are smaller. And can they come visit you? We do do private tastings actually at my uh, family's home in Napa. Um, okay. and so just by reaching out to us, our email address is on our website. Um, and we are more than happy to, um, host tastings. Um, we also, if you are adventurous, and want to go out and see the vineyard, we try to accommodate any requests we were, we get to go out and see the vineyard. Um, and Todd will generally host those. Do they need to cut, show up in like a VW van? Yeah. To... <laughs> yeah with the tie dye curtains. And... Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, that would, I mean, that would be so much fun, I think. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's definitely a long and winding road, but it's one of the most beautiful and dramatic wine growing regions, I would venture to say in the world. Um, I mean, it's truly wild and rural and beautiful. Um, and so definitely uh, a place to visit, especially if you love wine. And does Todd live in that area or? He lives in the Santa Rosa area. Oh, so he's got so a little drive. I think 90 minutes from the vineyard. I'm, I live in Napa actually, so I'm two and a half hours from the vineyard. Um, but, um, but yeah, Todd makes that drive three or four times a week, most of the year. So yeah. it's a lot of dedication. A little bit of miles on that vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you are also on social media. Yes. Um, at Wayfair Vineyard on Instagram. Um, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time out to share these wines with me. And I will have to try to get my hands on some of that Pinot um very cool to I love the whole clone concept yes, we'll do it. We'll, I'll, I'll be sure to send you a bottle <laughs> thank you um, the whole the whole clone concept I love it because it's I try to explain to people there's clones in pretty much every grape variety there is because it's just a natural mutation and it's but certain grape pinot and chardonnay and mostly pinot mm -hmm. like 
that's that's the thing about Pino, right? Mm-hmm. Is all of those mutations, you know, mm-hmm. like Cab Franc has has clones also, but you don't ever hear people saying, oh, well, I'm going to bottle this clone or I'm going to bottle this clone mm-hmm. or whatever. But mm-hmm. um, Pinot Noir, you have very specific clones that people follow. It's like cult followings for a specific clone. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And you're absolutely right. It, that same clone is very different in two completely different regions. And that plays to the to the role of what Pinot is. Um, and I think Chardonnay is actually the second like known for for clones. And you you do have the Wente, which, you know, um is is and I don't know if there's more than one there's probably more than one Wente. There's also. lots of there's lots of different old Wente clones. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And each one has its own little character that you can fall in love with. Absolutely. And, that I, I'll just end with, I have a very big issue with people who say if something comes from a single vineyard, it cannot be complex. And that is so not true. And these wines definitely demonstrate that, that it it's, if you're taking from a single vineyard and it's, it, yeah, it cannot be complex, but that's because the vineyard manager isn't paying attention to the actual vineyard. Well, the greatest wines of the world come from single vineyard bottlings. That mm-hmm. just that's just a fact. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I don't know where, where the Americans get this concept that you can't have that. Yeah. Um, but this definitely disproves that or, or disproves that myth proves that that myth is wrong. However, yes. <laughs> however, however it is. I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. So these are, these are beautiful wines and thank you so much for sharing them with me and for taking time out. And I'll raise my glass and say slancha. And thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Lori. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you.